Good to have you with us this morning. We do have a number of visitors with us. We're honored to have you with us. You're an honored guest, and we're delighted to see you. As we think about God's Word and our lives together as we face eternity, I thought this morning I'd like for us to talk about the words of life. We'll find those in John chapter 6, verses 66 through 69. The record, as we've already noticed from John chapter 6, verses 53 through 58, Jesus said some very difficult things. John chapter 6, verse 66, the record says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and followed him or walked with him no more. Jesus then turned to the twelve and said, Do you also want to go away? And Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and know that you are the Son of God, the Son of the living God. In these verses, there are some very powerful lessons. And I'd like for us to look at those this morning. Let's look at the background a little bit first, though. The subject begins in chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Jesus, of course, in this passage is emphasizing that He is the bread of life. And so as to, on this occasion, He fed 5,000 people with, with a miraculous uh, application of, of food. That basically created some problems in a way, and it's some good things. Jesus sent the disciples, or they chose to go on the other side of the lake, lake, and Jesus went walking on the water, went on the other side with them to the place called Capernaum. Many of those who had been fed because they had no love for spiritual matters, nor had the deepness of spiritual interest in their hearts, went across the lake to follow Jesus. And Jesus tells us in, in this chapter that when they got there, what they were looking for was more food, more free food. And he said, you came to follow me, not because of, of the miracles and signs which I did, but because of the fact that I fed you with, with the five loaves and the two fish. And so as a result of that, then he made some very difficult statements to them. We read about those. And when the disciples heard it, they said, who can understand this? Who can receive this? This is too difficult for us. And so as a result of that, they turned back. Many of them did. Many of his disciples actually forsook him. They turned and went back and followed him no more. And so as we look at it, then we look at the Savior's question first. In verses 66 and 67, Jesus said, do you also want to go away? That's an important statement if you think about it for a moment. When you realize what Jesus said, notice the twelve were free to go or to stay. They were free moral beings. No one compulsed them or forced them or, or made them to stay with Jesus. They had the right to go or to stay, to choose whatever they wanted to do. And so that's why Jesus asked, do you also want to go away? And as you think about it, then that thought basically is the Lord, He wouldn't force them. We possibly could have. He would never do that. And so every man was free, every disciple, every apostle was free to go or stay just as He chose to do. The, the option was His. Nobody was forcing Him or compulsing Him. Make Him do anything. But now you understand the Lord loved these men. His love for them was so deep. In fact, John tells us in John chapter 14 that Jesus said, my love for you is supreme. I, I even would die for you. And so as we look at it, then He, he wanted them to stay with Him. He wanted them to follow Him. But they were not indispensable. Had they chosen to go back like all the others, Jesus would simply have had to start over with, with 12 more. He could have done that. But, but He knew these men and He knew their character and He knew their hearts. And He knew they would stay with Him. Now think about it for a moment as we begin to make application today for us, for you and for me. Every disciple of Jesus today is free to go or free to stay. The option is ours. We have the choice. God gave us the ability to make choices. Of course, there are consequences to those choices, but He gave us the right. And so God wants us to be faithful to His Son. Jesus wants us to be faithful to Him. That's His greatest desire, that we would love Him more than the world, that we would give ourselves over to Him completely and totally, that we would follow Him all of our days in faithfulness, and we would die in Him and go be with Him forever. But, but each day presents a choice for you and for me. Each moment of each day presents a choice, whether we draw closer to Jesus or whether we turn back to the, to the beggarly elements of the world. In Matthew 24, 13, Jesus said, Because lawlessness will abound. Listen to it. 
The love of many will grow cold. The love of many will grow cold, but he endures to the end. He who remains faithful to the end. He who holds on as long as there's life. In Revelation 2.10, the Lord said to the church, one of those churches, He said, basically, if you'll be faithful until death, I'll give you a crown of life. It's the idea of being faithful to the Lord, never turning aside, never giving up, never going back into the world as long as we live till death takes us from this life. A week ago yesterday, I performed a wedding ceremony for my oldest grandson. In that wedding ceremony, I made this statement to both of them. Forsaking all others, you will keep yourself to him or to her as the case may be. And to him or to her alone so long as you both shall live. That's the same commitment we make to the Lord. That's the same promise we give to the Lord. I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to forsake all others. And we'll talk about some of those in a minute. But what about you? And what about me? What about my life today? And what about the world I live in? And how I devote myself to the Lord? And how I face daily the challenges of sin and the, the love of the world? You know, God has redeemed us through His Son. And Jesus has redeemed us by His blood. 1 Peter chapter 1 tells us in verse 18 that we were not redeemed with silver and gold, but we were redeemed with precious things. The blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without spot, without blemish. What about you to whose wounded soul, whose sin-sick soul, He has poured the bomb of pardoning mercy. He's shown you mercy. He's shown you grace. He's given you forgiveness of your sins. He's drawn you close to Him. He's made you a part of His family and added you to, to His Son's body. What about you? Will you forsake all that and go back? You who has comfort. Think about all the tribulations and trials we've had in life. And how many times as God's children we can pour out our hearts to Him and find comfort and solace and help in times of need. And you think about all of the, the life we live as, as Christians today and the offenses that we do and the sin we do and the mistakes we make. And He's continually pardoned us fully and given us all kind of forgiveness. Will we go away? Will we turn back? That's the choice you make and the choice I make. So lesson number one this morning. How are we going to live in view of eternity? Are we going to follow the Lord faithfully? Are we going to give our lives to Him? Are we going to submit to Him? Are we going to be all He wants us to be to the best of our ability? Are we going to basically just go through the motions, lose our first love, have some love for the world, participate in the worldly things? What are we going to do? But notice, notice Peter's question, verse 68. Lord, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? Uh, Peter's question carried the implication that all men, from at least from a spiritual standpoint, if not from a physical standpoint, all of us need someone to whom we can go. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. The way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. I need guidance. I need strength. I need instruction. I need help from God Almighty to be all that I can be and from His Son, Jesus Christ, who gives me the words of life and tells me how I'm supposed to live. It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. So Peter's implication, what he asked the question, he asked, implied certain things. And one of those is, how shall we find a more gracious master than this one, than, than you? How can we find a more powerful Redeemer how may we find a more suitable Savior than you, O oh Lord? You have the words of life. You see, Jesus was the only one, and Peter recognized this, the only one who can teach the doctrine of salvation. There is salvation, no other. There none other can confer the gift of eternal life, but you alone. Man's nature is such that we must choose whether we choose God and Christ or mammon and the world. Which are we going to choose? To whom shall we go? To some in our world today, they go to various world religions, the isms, if you will. Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and all, all those other things. Some in our world today basically use the choice, I will go only so far, but, but I'm going to go to the church of my choice. I want a church that pleases me, that makes me feel good. doesn't matter what they teach as long as it makes me feel good. And so there, there are myriads of denominations to which one can go, to which one can at least join themselves to make themselves feel good. But it's not going to help spiritually. Some in our academic world, this is where we really face some problems today. 
We're told that there is no God, there is no Christ. The Bible is a fallacy. It's really a fable. You can't trust it. You can't believe in it. And so we're told that man has, has accomplished all that he's accomplished by his own abilities, by his own will, by, by whatever he can do for himself. And so in our academic world today, there are those, there, and there are myriads of them, who follow this philosophy. But folks, the all important questions, where I came from, why I'm here, where I'm going, None of those are answered by our academic world. Only the answer for those is found in Jesus Christ. There is simply no substitute for Christ. Simply is not. Now notice Peter's affirmation. You have the words of life. And we believe and know that you are the son of the living God. What a wonderful statement he made. What a wonderful declaration. Peter at least finally perfectly understood all that Jesus was saying, all that Jesus meant, and the idea of eating His flesh and drinking His blood. And incidentally, that basically has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper. It has reference to Jesus Christ and accepting Him and following Him and being a part of Him and letting Him be a part of us. Salvation is, is in Jesus alone and, and no other person can give us salvation but Him. In John chapter 11, there's an interesting scenario where Lazarus has died and Jesus has now come to the house of Mary and Martha. And in that context, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Listen to this. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he will live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Spiritually. He who lives and believes in me shall never die. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter made this observation. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus. Jesus put it this way in John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Of all the teachers who ever instructed the human race, of all of the religious leaders who have ever lived and instructed and taught and had a doctrine or taught the Bible, only Jesus delivered that convincing body of truth, the words of life. Turn away from Jesus, our Lord. To forsake Him, as did many of the disciples on that day, is to turn to darkness and despair. Think with me for a moment. Let me borrow your imagination, if I may. You're in a lifeboat in a raging sea. The waves are tossing to it, and you know death is facing you. This boat is not going to be able to make it safely. And so you're in this at midnight, the darkest time of the night, and all of a sudden you look, and there is one beacon of light. And you know that if you can, can go to that beacon of light, you will be saved. You'll be, you'll be able to be safe. Your, your ship will take you there to the harbor. Now who in his right mind would say, I don't care about the light? Who in his right mind would say, I don't like that light or, or I don't need that light? And so as you think about it, to turn away from the only light, the only spiritual light there is, is to choose darkness and death. Separation from God, separation from Christ throughout all of eternity. In John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. In Him was life, John says. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Life in Christ. His life is the light of men. And in Him, in Him alone, there's hope. But now we turn to, to the, the very focus of our lesson, the words of life. The words of life. Life is in these words. The words of Jesus. And we're going to notice that in a minute. Outside of those words, the words of men, the words of false teachers, the words of the doctrines of the world are nothing. In John chapter 6, this same chapter, back in verse 63, Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. The words that I speak to you are life. Think about that for just a moment. The importance of, of what is said. Jesus' word is the bread of life. You know the Bible talks about it, and we talk about sometimes the, the pyramid of, of food that we ought to eat. The very most substantial and the beginning point is bread. We have to have bread to live. We must have bread to live. Without bread, we shall die. So bread is, is essential to life. Bread is essential to physical life. Bread is essential to spiritual life. 
And so Jesus said when He was tempted by Satan, as Matthew records it for us, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. When Satan said, if you be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Words. You remember Acts chapter 10? There was a man named Cornelius who saw a vision. And in the vision, Cornelius didn't understand. He was afraid. But, but the, the, the one who came to him made this observation. Send a Joppa for one called Peter. And listen to it. He shall tell thee words whereby thou shalt be saved. He shall tell you words. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul says, It pleased God by the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And so, as you think about it, the, the power of words, it all begins with, with understanding and listening to the words of God, the words of Christ, the words that are inspired in our Holy Scriptures, their life, their spirit, and they give us salvation and they give us instruction how to live the Christian life all of our days. But Jesus' Word is also the germ of life. In Luke chapter 8, Luke records for us in the first few verses of that chapter what we call the parable of the sower or the parable of the soils or, or whatever other name you choose to call it. But a sower went forth to sow and he sowed seed in four places. When Jesus had told that parable, the disciples didn't fully understand it. So later on privately, they asked him and he told them what, what it meant. And he began with this statement, the seed is the Word of God. Seed, the Word of God. Listen to what it does. The seed of God's Word when sown in an open and a receptive heart can transform a life completely. Can lead one from destruction and death to salvation and safety. Those words that are sown in the human heart when they're accepted and they're acted upon and they're believed fully and made a part of our life, they can give us eternal life. They can tell us what sin is and how to avoid sin. They can tell us the consequences of sin. They can tell us the blessings that God has provided for us and the promises God's given. And they can assure us of our eternal destiny with Him forever in heaven. The germ of life. Life is in the seed. Life is in the Word. And so, as we look at it, Jesus' Word is the light of life as well. We sang this song this morning. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Think about this. Here's someone walking in darkness, maybe at midnight, uh, without a flashlight, with no street lights. And there is then this, this one light. We've already talked some about that, but, but somebody's approaching with, with a flashlight and helps you to find your way. Your word, David said. Your word is a lamp to my feet. It tells me where I can walk and not stumble. It tells me where I can place my feet with safety. Your word is as a lamp to my, and it's a light to my pathway. It illuminates the way that I should go. Uh, John, Matthew rather, chapter 7, verses 13 and following, talks about the idea that there's two ways, the broad way, the narrow way. God's word illuminates for us the right way and assures us of the hope and the promises for walking the right way. God's word is the light that tells us the, how we should walk and where we should go and gives us the blessings and the promises of walking that way. But Jesus' words also have the power to raise us from the grave. See, you are, you are an immortal being. Your physical body will die. It'll go back to the dust from whence it came, according to Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. Yes, it'll go back to the dust, but you'll never die. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 28, Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming when all that are in the grave shall hear His voice, hear His voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life and they that have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Yes, we're going to be raised from the grave by the Word, by the power of God. And so as we, we think about the idea that's, that's involved, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as those who have no hope. For we, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall in no ways precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Jesus Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Listen to the last part of that. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Yes, Jesus' words have the power to not only give us eternal life in this life, but give us eternal life in the world to come. Can you imagine the beautiful, wonderful scene as we stand before Jesus Christ in judgment and hear Him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what it's all about, folks. That's all of our efforts expended toward that, that, that goal. And we could live with Him eternally. And so we conclude with this thought that Peter gives us. You, you are the Son of the living God. Think about it with me. Jesus Christ is man's only hope and God's only remedy. Without Him we're lost and undone. His blood has made our salvation. We noticed that this morning. His blood has made our salvation firm and sure. His blood paid the price for your sins. His blood paid the price for my sins. His blood was shed on that cross that all men might have an opportunity to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth and to live for Him, die with Him, and serve Him forever in eternity. So the plan of salvation. Well, what is the plan of salvation? Simply that we believe in Jesus Christ as God's Son. I know you believe in Jesus or you wouldn't be here. But do you believe in Him enough that you've committed your life to Him? That you simply, in simple faith, that you have obeyed what He's told you to do and that you are living for Him each day of your life. If you've not done that, then you're not walking in the light. And if you've gone back into the world, uh, listen to what the record says in John chapter 6, verse 66. From that time, many of His disciples walked with Him no more. Maybe that's your condition. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you've never obeyed the gospel. I know you believe in Jesus, but are you willing to commit your life to Him? Would you basically come forward this morning after having repented of your sins, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, be immersed in the waters of baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, a new creature, the record says. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You begin a new life basically because of the teaching of the words of Jesus Christ. And you can live for Him who died for you. And so the question is, am I going to submit my life to Him? Am I going to give myself to Him? Am I going to follow Him all of my days? Am I going to be what He wants me to be? Am I going to live faithfully for Him? And the choice is yours. But see, if you're not in a covenant relationship with Him this morning, you have a perfect opportunity to do whatever you need to do to make your life right with Him. This invitation is not mine. It's not the elders. It's not the Highland Heights Church. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So the choice is yours. And we talked about this choice thing. It's up to you. What will you do with your life from this moment forward? If we can help you in any way, would you please come while we stand together and sing?